My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. Hello, I'm your host, Les Bubka. Welcome to Anxious Black Belt, a podcast that focuses on karate, mental health, and everything in between. If you enjoy our content and would like to support us, best way to do that is to listen to another episode, share with your friends, and leave us a review. All this stuff helps the mysterious algorithm to introduce our podcast to new audience. Thank you for joining me, and let's listen to the episode. Hello, Troy. Nice to see you again. Uh, after yeah, good to see you too. Yeah. How was your journey? Because you went on the mission to try all the martial arts that you can around the world. I don't say I'm very envious of that, that you have a <laughs> chance and opportunity to go from the country to country. And in that, that it, because of that, we met in the UK. How was the trip? Yeah. Tell, us about the, tell us about the project. It was stressful and tiring, but extremely fun. <laughs> Trying to do it on a time limit was, um, yeah, extremely uh, taxing. But now that it's finished, I look back and just it's so, so much fun and so glad I did it. I was actually just going through the list of all the things I'd done to make sure I remembered some of them when we spoke. And, and I was just like, wow, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> So which one, which one was the most in interesting for you personally? Uh, I've got two I really like to talk about. There's um, Because my background was karate, but then um, predominantly Muay Thai. I lived in Thailand for three and a half years just training in Muay Thai. And there used to be, well, still is, this big hate between Muay Thai and Taekwondo. You know, mm -hmm. for some reason, they hate each other. <laughs> and... Um, I was no different. And uh, we went to Korea. Well, we're going past Korea. And I thought, I can't not be in Korea and do Taekwondo. So I was like, I'm either going to really hate it or whatever. I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to have fun with it. And it was probably the funnest martial art that I did over the whole trip. I enjoyed it probably the most. Um, I was very surprised by that, but it was a lot of fun. Um, the second one that was... The, probably the most memorable because of the cultural differences as well was probably um, Indian wrestling. Uh. Yeah, that that was something um, I didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I went there to do, um, and I always get this wrong, uh, Kalapawatu. It's, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like a mix of karate and a mix of yoga and a mix of other things. But they said it's not yoga, but it's definitely got some in it. Um, they said, oh, you should try Indian wrestling while you were here. And I was like, what's that? And when I went there, they said Indian wrestling is what they use in the Olympics. It, it actually all traveled from there. Whether that's 100% true or not, I don't know. But um, we walk, walked into this gym and there was the big blue mat with the circle on it. All the guys in red and blue, you know, the leotards and that. And I was just like, cool, I'm going to learn some proper wrestling, you know. And they're like, you're not in here today. You're you're in this, you're at the back here. So we go out the back and there's the guy dragging the big piece of wood with a rope over his head to flatten out the mud and stuff. And um, and they're like, have you ever wrestled before? And I said, never. I said, I, I can clinch okay, but never wrestling. Done a little bit of jujitsu. And um, they're like, you're gonna you're gonna fight today. And I was like, <laughs> what <laughs> they're like yeah yeah you'll be right you've done lots of martial arts and stuff and i said i've never wrestled i said could you at least show me one or two moves and they're like no no you'll be fine you'll be fine and this is coming off the back of me having like my big back injuries and my hip injuries and and all this sort of stuff so i was supposed to be taking it easy and um the first guy comes out and he's huge 
is like they're like this is the 96 kilo Olympic champion, and he's just huge, absolutely massive, and um, he just mopped the floor with me for two rounds, just absolutely smashed me. And um, the first move I thought I was just going to rush him and try and get him to stand up straight because, you know, they're sort of hunched over. Yeah. And then so I can at least try and get a clinch. And all he did was drop to one knee and flip me straight over his head. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I was pretty knackered after that. Then they're like, oh, um, here's an 86 kilo Asian champion for you to wrestle. And he mopped the floor with me for two rounds. But what was cool is their coach would walk around with a massive stick and for three hours, they had to do either burpees or climb up arms only up a rope to the top of the tree and back down. If you weren't wrestling, you either had to do one of those two things or you got hit with this big cane that the trainer was walking around with. So that was probably the most memorable one. Cool. How did you find the reception of your um, kind of arrival and stuff? Did, did you have uh, like every country was super welcoming? Did you have like a range first or? Did you just go and say, uh, hello, I'm here. There's my uh, wife with the camera. <laughs> I'm going to be filming now. <laughs> or did you try to prearrange it? I tried to do it. So because we were winging where we we're actually going, I, th I thought we'll go to the first country and see where we're going next and try and find a gym a week in advance. In the, the Asian countries, that was easy as. I just messaged a gym. They'd be like, yeah, sweet as, come down. Mm. um but in the uk i found that a little bit harder um and that's like thanks to you i actually found some really good trainers there and um mm. that was good uh the only place that i felt a bit um off put was we went to hong kong mm -hmm. and uh to do wing chun and i messaged a couple of wing chun masters and stuff like that with some really good lineage and some of them wanted a thousand australia for ah. for an hour lesson and i was just like wow luckily i found this really good school um and they were um it man lineage mm -hmm. uh but they were actually aussies that had moved there and had been the training there for like 20 years and um yeah they really looked after me yeah but they took, I, they took the i didn't PT. get that real <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> yeah yeah so they let me join in the class and gave me some personal <laughs> training on the side it was yeah they looked after me <laughs> Yeah. You you said that you have uh, you had a background in karate. I'm guessing from your logos, it's Kyokushin, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How yep, long did yeah. you spend so, in Kyokushin? Uh, I did two years when I was really young, like six to eight, and then um, I left for a couple of years. And then I went back from like ten to twelve. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I did a couple of different karates throughout the time, and then when I went to live in Thailand, I trained with Judd Reed for six months mm -hmm. as well. So still keeping in that lineage and, you know, my background's Dutch and, and I always liked mixing it up. So essentially what I say I sort of do is similar to like K1. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, Dutch um, uh, kickboxing is famous all over the world. So. Yeah. It's and a, the, and the basis of that is actually Kaikashin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you tell me about your um, mental health project? Because that's something that interests me. And, and I know that you guys are all trained mental health professionals. And so I, how the project works and what you do, guys? Yeah. Yeah. So the business is called Complete Health Geelong. Uh, we're a mental health and disability service. And we happen to have a gym. Everybody thinks we're just a gym, but we're a mental health and disability service first. So we're a team of 20 support workers. We've got... Um, personal care assistants, mental health workers, alcohol and other drugs, um, uh, teachers' aides, uh, counsellors, personal trainers. Um, and But everybody has um, lived experience. So like myself, I'm an ex-bikey and I suffered from nearly all the letters in the alphabet <laughs> at one point or another. And a lot of the people that work for me too do as well. A lot of them are actually on the spectrum as well. Um, they've all had past lives, you know, pretty colorful lives and that as well. So we all have been along our healing journey. And then um, at some point or another, just decided it's time to give back. So I started originally doing just abuse counseling. And um, I started working with couples and 
um, people that had been through abusive relationships. And then all of a sudden, people started saying to me, can you train my kids? Mm -hmm. And because what I was doing, I call it exercise psychotherapy. So I mix counselling and personal training together, but I do it with martial arts. Mm -hmm. It's I try and tell people, if you go to a counselling session, it might take you four or five sessions to build up that really strong relationship. But you'll know for yourself, when you've got someone on the pads, mm -hmm. within 10 minutes, you're their life coach. You're their, you're their, you know, just everything to them. They'll be asking you what they should do, what they should do for their life, what job they should be looking at, um, what, they, what nutrition they should have, how they could try and get their goals. That connection is nearly instant when it comes down to being a coach. Mm -hmm. So I mix the two. And there's another thing called DBT therapy where you can, let's say, for example, you have a really traumatic experience and you can't talk about it. So in DBT, they might do something like get you to hold a block of ice mm -hmm. while you talk about it so that you're focusing on the block of ice because it feels like it's actually burning your hand, even though it's not. But what's happening is if you picture a sharp knife and... um Every time you use that knife, it gets blunter. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened. That's what's happening every time you talk about the trauma, even if you're not fully focused on it. Every single time you talk about it, it dulls the pain of it till eventually you can talk about it in a relaxed body and you can process it and work your way through it. So I use the block of, as the block of ice. I'll use the martial arts or I'll use weights. So I'll be talking about something and I'll just segue into I know what we should be talking about. And then if they start struggling, we stop talking about it and then work really hard, you know, like do something that they really have to cognitively, cognitively think about or something that's really going to be taxing as like a circuit breaker that just snaps them out of whatever they're going through. And then the program just built on that. So then I started doing a men's mental health class. Then I started doing Muay Thai for mental health. Then um, it's just a safe place for people to come and talk. And then that built on... What, what else can we do from there to help people? Well, people need to be engaged outside of the gym as well. So we started doing support groups. And now I just had a meeting today about taking some of our guys to actually volunteer somewhere else to help build up meaning and purpose. So it, it all comes around in this big circle. So you've got the counselling, which works on the hard trauma. They go work with a support worker. The support worker gets them out kicking ass in life, you know, achieving goals, getting out of their comfort zone. Once they've got that, the support worker takes them to the support groups until they're no longer needed and they can come to the support groups by themselves because they've built up confidence enough, they've made some friends. In the support groups, we always do a fun activity and then we will do a, um, a cooking class as well. Mm -hmm. And then um, hopefully they get to a point where they're like, sorry, we don't need you anymore. Um, we're doing pretty good in life and um, thank you for all your help. See you later which is the goal for everything. Yeah, yeah, it, it is um, interesting. Uh, I've got the same, it's a bit hard to let people go when they feel better and they say, that, thank you, I don't need you, I'm leaving the group. Awesome, but, um, uh, you know, uh, we're going to be missing you. It was nice to train with you. Troy, can I get a five minutes break? Because my shopping yeah. arrived. Can I, yeah, sure, no worries. Can we, can we, sorry about that. No, no, <laughs> Just, all good. Oh, you're really, back. Really sorry about that. My wife forgot to tell me that her meeting was cancelled. So, yeah, no, that's okay. Can't win. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So you've been saying yeah. about the uh, helping people and then they getting better and they moving on. And we've been saying that um, it is difficult to departure with people, but in the same way, you are like super happy because you help them, right? And um, yeah, that's the rewarding how, part. Yeah. How many clients do you get for like for the week? Um, so all up, we've got about 150 on our books, um, but some of them come and go. So we've got about, uh, I think at the moment, about 75 active, like every week. Um, but that's not just out of the gym stuff. So that's doing all the support work and all that stuff. A lot of them actually don't come to the gym. So that's usually a different group of people, but the gym's pretty quiet, so we're trying to market that at the moment because that's my little, that's my little passion. I love when people 
when people do actually come to those groups, that is where they do get the best results. Hmm. It's just um, getting people into them that we're finding to be the hardest part. We've still got, so we started four years ago. We still have people like the original people that started actually hmm. still in this program. So it's just getting them in. That's the problem. So we've just released the mental health militia. Hmm. That's a, um, it's a non-for-profit and it's ran by guys with pass so that I like, so like myself, I used to be an ex-bikey and, and all this. So I try and say, if somebody like me can talk about emotions, so can you. Oh. So one day we decided to get on our bikes and say, if anyone wants to, wants to come down on a bike, there'll be a qualified counselor, be myself and a couple of mental health workers. Um, we're going to have a barbecue. So if anyone needs a chat, come down. 300 bikes later. Wow. Um, we, yeah, we decided we better make this an annual thing. Uh, so we're coming up to our third year this year and all the money raised from that actually goes to sponsor people to come to our events in the, in the gym that can't afford it. Because part of the big problem with mental health is somebody will wake up and they'll go, I want to change. I want the help. They'll go to somewhere and say, I want the help. And they'll say, okay, it costs this much. Uh And all of a sudden they're like, I don't have that. Then their people will say, well, cool, you have to go apply here, apply there, go see your GP. And then as soon as they walk out that door, you never see them again. Yeah. So what we're trying to do with the mental health militia is when somebody comes in, we say, okay, look, we'll give you a week free of any of our, of, well, all of our services. And um, if at the end of that, you know, everything's going well, we'll talk about a sponsorship. So if they come to every session, they don't miss. If they, you know, for example, one of the boys yesterday, who was thinking about it, just, we didn't ask him to do this. He was just like, oh, your, your bins are full. Can I empty your bins for you? Mm. You know, so we're like, cool. Um, so all we ask is anybody that does a sponsorship, they don't miss any classes. Um, they have to help around the gym. They, when we do the, as we do a free barbecue for men's mental health every month, they have to come man the barbecues, but it's more about giving back the, yeah. to make them feel a part of the group. So it's not that we're getting them to work for us for free. It creates a sense of meaning, purpose. They're giving back. They're connected in the community and they feel a part of something bigger than themselves. And usually in life, if things are given for free, you know, people people take advantage of that. Yeah, and don't Mm -hmm. value it. So this way, they get to feel like they're a part of the group. They get to help out. And we're finding that's actually really cool. We are trying to do the same thing, so I do the concessions and the, and the free training as well for people. And actually, now this month we're registering our own CIC, so community interest company, somewhere between a charity and the normal company. So yeah. that's why it's very interesting for me. How how did you manage? To, how what was the process of uh, registering a company and what support from the Australian government you get? I know it's completely different to the UK, but it's. From some people I hear, it's a very difficult. Other people say it's easy. Um, how does that in your case and what made you a, a success story? Yeah, it, <laughs> you know, we get the same thing here. Where I've got a couple of friends with charities as well, and they swear they did it in a weekend. Um, and we have tried. We cannot work it out. That's not where my forte is. Mm-hmm. Um, I like being in the gym, working with the guys, you know. Um so when it comes to that back end sort of stuff, I'm terrible. So luckily, um, so we we had a really good accountant. So he did all the structure for us. And now that's in the hands of some new sponsors that have come on in the last couple of weeks that are really good at funding, that are really good at grant writing projects, that are really good at um, doing the actual registration process for us and all of that. So luckily in the next few months, we'll be able to see a really good social media web page and everything pop up thanks to thanks to these guys, um, which is allowing me more time to do stuff like this and do stuff for Complete Out Geelong. Yeah, but it it is, I find it very difficult, but others don't. So, yeah, the first step was just going to the accountant and saying, can you do this for us? Because I don't have the know-how to do it. And then find, I always say, I've learned this just through my business in the last four years. If you can hire some a professional to do it with the expertise to do it, hire them. Don't do it yourself. Um, for for some things, anyway. For for back, if you're a people person, generally, you're probably not going to be good at the other stuff. So hire somebody to do the other stuff. Because I have tried to do that, and I just burn out, and I get stressed, and I get frustrated, and then 
that takes my energy to do the other stuff. Yeah, I was thinking about it as well, like, and 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 I decided that yeah, I'm gonna pay for a consultancy to help me guide through the process because in the long run, it saves me my health, my mental <laughs> health, and probably money in a long time as well. So <laughs> today I went for a mentorship, so hopefully it's starting next week. Yeah, um, and we can do do similar stuff, and you know, it's it's nice. You know, when I started in UK doing the karate for mental health, I didn't know anybody else doing it, and now. It's a, I met you, I met um, uh, Georgia from Australia as well. She's doing a uh, trauma-informed kickboxing. And, you know, it's just more people popping up doing stuff and you can learn and exchange the knowledge. And for me, it's great to speak to people like you who've got more experience in that field that I can pick a little bit for me and, um, you know, learn as well. So how did you get into the uh side of healing and becoming a counselor and stuff what what drove driven you into it um pretty much i thought like everyone does i thought i was fine all my life until i found out that i wasn't mm -hmm. so um I, you know nobody really ends up in a motorcycle club because they're super healthy you know if we're uh peter pan syndrome and and all this sort of stuff so but i didn't know that at the time so I went through a series of abusive relationships um, and then I um, did five discs in my back and then I shattered my hip and then I uh, lost my brother all in the space of a couple of months and basically hit rock bottom, didn't know who I was, where I was going, um, just couldn't couldn't leave the house at the time, um, just in a pretty, pr pretty bad headspace and you know, I was in the perfect place to do it. I was, you know, my, my environment was just sex, drugs, and rock and roll at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't working because of my injuries. So besides the club, I had nothing. So it was just all party. Um, until it wasn't, until I sort of realized that I can't keep repeating these same patterns. So um, luckily, work cover sent me to a um, cancer a psychologist. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I thought I'm going to go in here and, you know, play the system and, um, you know, be off work forever and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the first 15, 20 minutes of the session, I was bawling my eyes out like a little kid. And um, I just found the perfect psychologist for me. And I basically went, sometimes I went twice a week. It was always once a week for about seven years, but sometimes twice a week. And it was just life-changing. About halfway through, so in, after about three years of intense therapy, um, and I become a trauma nerd. So when you when you have a, um, a breakup, especially from like narcissistic abuse or something like that, you have this big void and it needs to be filled. I filled it with trauma. There's a, there's a saying that goes, um, all I wanted was a, a relationship, but now I've got a degree in psychology. Um, that's pretty much how it worked. So um, I just studied trauma because I didn't want to end up in this position again. I was like, I'm done. This has been a, rep a repeating pattern all my life. I'm, I'm sick of it. I need to do something about it. So I was studying flat out. So for about three years solid and then um, just home study, just out of interest and back then i was very manic so i wasn't sleeping much so i was there, there was some times there was like, i remember there was a six uh about a six week block i slept for one hour a night and all i did was wow. study um just completely manic and um then after yeah, about three and a half years i decided to go and do some real qualifications i'd done a, a lot of qualifications online but no real legit registered ones yeah. so i went and um got a traineeship in drug and alcohol. And then I did counseling, community services, mental health, disability, and um, then sort of meshed them all up with my own little package and did some trauma-informed stuff and learned all about adverse childhood experiences and complex trauma. And uh, then I basically just want all that, all that three and a half years of pulling information from here from 50 different places. It was so hard to find what I needed. So I thought there's got to be other people out there like me and that are Ocker Bogans, like Aussie Bogans, the same as me, that need everything spoken to them in a relatable way. So 
I just got clinical stuff and broke it down into an easy way that I could understand. And now that, and then I created this. So I've, I've actually got a book. So it hasn't been released yet. I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy actually. Um, I only finished it a couple of weeks ago. So awesome. It, yeah. It's, it's every single thing I've learned about trauma that I, it's like a trauma 101 book. If you read this whole book, you will know everything you need to know about how everything works to know why you do the things you do and to how to overcome it. Yeah. Cool. Looking forward to it. I was actually talking yesterday with somebody who was, um, I've got lots of friends who tell me, oh, I'm thinking of writing a book. No, just just write it. Everybody's carrying yeah. a book inside. Um, yeah, so 100%. I'm really, really, really happy that you actually done a book. And uh, we, yeah, we need, especially on mental health, um, I think it's kind of, I, I've done pretty much similar thing to you. So I studied, I done courses here for UK, which are sponsored by government. But when it comes up to it, all those courses are worth nothing mm. because they give you a level two qualification. But you look at them, it's awareness of mental health. So they don't actually give you any real qualification to do anything with it. You're just aware of the problems, which yeah. that's not what I wanted. I spent six weeks or a year doing stuff that gives me nothing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking into doing um, some more qualification when the kid's going to be a little bit older because at the moment I'm a full-time taxi driver from one club to the <laughs> other club. <laughs> no, no time for studying, but uh, that's my plan. So it's, it's nice to hear from other people that, you know, even hitting the rock bottom, there is a chance to just go to school, go do stuff, sort yourself out and be able to give back and and to help other people, which you're doing. Uh, I was talking with uh, one of the guys from the Joe Blooming uh, team, so Kyokushin as well, and he asked me an interesting question, and I'm now imposing that question on everybody. So <laughs> brace yourself. Um, okay. If you have only a couple words, what will be your core principles for a your dojo or your life? So for me, it's strong and caring. I that, we've got that at home. That's the rules for my kids. You need to be strong in mind and body because then you can help others and you can be caring. What would be yours? The first two that just immediately pop to mind is integrity and authenticity. You're the second person who said that. <laughs> is that is the, both like the two yeah. same ones? Oh, I like to be original, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but ex ex explain, explain, because uh, people, stay, you know, we're using the very limited words, uh, but the words meaning are different meanings for other people. So go on, explain. Okay. So integrity, integrity is who you are when nobody's looking. It's, it's not giving the homeless person some money and taking a photo for Facebook. Mm. And, and to me, so the integrity does, it doesn't just mean that you're a good person. It means that you don't need external validation. And if you don't need external validation, there is a good chance you're going to be very grounded. You're not going to be swayed by, by any external things. You're probably going to have good boundaries, internal and external. Um, oh, there, there is, there's so much just with integrity because you can be your own person with integrity. You don't need to, you will never use anybody. If you don't need external validation, if you don't need all these things, you can be your genuine self, which mm -hmm. brings you with brings me into authenticity. With authenticity, most people, the majority amount of people, I would say, don't live an authentic life, um, and that's a very sad thing. Um, just going through, and this this is the the abuse training background. Um, a lot of people wear a mask. So if you always wear a mask, you can never connect. You hear people say, um, I'm lonely in a room full of people. Mm -hmm. They're lonely because they wear a mask. If you wear a mask and try and pretend you're somebody else, you cannot authentically connect with anybody. If you cannot authentically collect, connect with anybody, you can't connect with yourself. And if you can't connect with yourself, you can't connect with a partner or anybody. So, And you're going to be insecure because you're obviously hiding insecurities with this mask. And if you're insecure, your relationships will never work. You're going to be jealous. You're going to push them away. Um, 
you're always going to need people instead of want people. And wants and needs are two totally different things. Mm -hmm. As soon as you need something, you're going to have a bad time, especially a partner. Um, being able to just want somebody and choosing to be with somebody, that's that's where the love is. If you need somebody to make you happy, all of a sudden you're going to get into a relationship that's got extreme highs, extreme lows, idolization, devaluation, because nobody can live up to your expectations to make you happy all the time. So the second they don't make you happy, you're going to look at them as the devil. So it's the God and the devil relationship. It's all good, all bad, black and white thinking. It's cognitive dissonance. So if you can't be authentic and say what you mean, you are always going to be um, bubbling inside. You're always going to be ready to pop. You're always going to be second guessing yourself and you just can't be yourself. And that's no way to live life. So mm -hmm. I think them two combined pretty much sums up a healthy, a healthy person. I, th I think nowadays, it, I feel like, you know, I came from Poland before the era of internet and stuff. And I think uh, in terms of uh, authenticity, it was easier than, than now for people, especially with the advent of Facebook and stuff. Everybody's putting that perfect life. And I, you know, I, I often put things that I cocked up or, didn't work out for me and, and I had get so much comments like, wow, you're sharing all your negative stuff. Well, because I'm trying to show people that it's not all roses, right? If if I've got the perfect life on a social media, I can guarantee that some of it is not so great for everybody, mm. right? We all going up and down and, and, and that's how you, the mental health for me is that the uh, spectrum that where you're dealing, either you're over happy or, or over sad, and that happy medium is where your balance mental health is. But if you got yeah. only a sharing only a good stuff, you making yourself disservice. If that makes sense? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I don't of... know if you saw. <laughs> <laughs> While I was traveling the world doing all this cool martial arts and I was putting up photos of I was training with this person and that person, I also put up posts intentionally to say that I was stressed about stuff at home or you know, the business back at home or this was going on or I, I wanted people to know that just because my highlight reel looked awesome, I was mm. I was doing some amazing stuff. It didn't mean we didn't get delays on planes. It didn't mean that um, the hotels didn't mess up. It didn't mean that things weren't going, you know, right all the time. I mean, it was a pretty awesome trip, but it was also super stressful. And I think people get sucked into people's highlight reels I mean, you can you can go to places. There was one place in Phuket. It's called a selfie gym. So you can go wow. to this place. They've actually got selfie rooms and stuff. So you can go, um, like, take a photo in a plane in a first, like, so it looks like you're in first class. You can rent this for an hour to get a photo shoot done. You can. It's just crazy the lengths people will go to to portray that sort of life, and it's making other people feel bad, you know, when it's not true. It's not genuine. Um, yeah. Trying to sell an image. They're masking, you know, they're carrying that mask. And people look at that and it affects them negatively. So I'm always conscious about putting that stuff up, the negative stuff up as well. Because it, mm. it is, it's easy to just post the good stuff. Yeah. Mm. And, and as well, you know, it, it's skewering uh, people's perception. And best example is the fitness industry with, you know, you see the Instagram post of people with the perfect bodies. And, you know, 90% of time it is made by Photoshop or good lighting yeah. and, you know, uh, creams on you and suntan and stuff like that. So it's not about how you look like all the time. Yeah. But but young people aspire to that. And, and I think that's causing a lot of mental health as well, both in men and women, trying to live up to the image that is unrealistic and unachievable. Yeah, 100%. Have you seen that everyone's like, oh, it's only women that really have, like, unrealistic bodies to go for with Barbie and stuff like that. I'm like, have, have you seen He-Man? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it, body image is something I've definitely always struggled with and especially after my injuries. So I went from being in Thailand training twice a day, you know, eating 4,000 calories to not being, not being able to use one of my legs for 12 months, like non-weight bearing. So, and, you know, three months of that, I was spent in bed, but I still ate the same. <laughs> So I, I put, and 
like there was some other couple of other reasons, but I ballooned out to like 163 kilos. Wow. And um and it's easy, it, it would be no one's ever said anything, but I imagine that people look at me and go, How's this guy a personal trainer? How is this guy that it, it doesn't matter that I'm under 120 now from 163. Mm. They just see this big guy and like, how's this guy a personal trainer? But people don't understand that there's you don't know what's happened in someone else's life that's mm. made them like that. I've seen um other big personal trainers online get absolutely bashed. And I, yeah. there's one in particular I know about, and he actually had a back injury from powerlifting. Um, and he was fit as before. It looked fit as powerlifters eat, eat so many calories. And he just made the same mistake I did. But with depression, food becomes a coping skill, especially if you're not doing drugs anymore. Yeah. You know, so so um, nobody, this is one thing I always say to everybody, Nobody wants to be overweight. So if people are overweight, there's a reason for it. And it's usually because of poor coping skills or poor emotional regulation skills. And it's something that I've always had to work on and something that I still do have to work on. Um, but getting down from that to that, especially with the life I've lived, it it's, a, it's validating for me. I don't need that external mm-hmm. voice anymore. Yeah, but it's definitely a big thing for kids these days. Like a massive, if you see, the um, the steroids use at the moment is yeah. absolutely crazy. It's like everybody's doing it now. It's like if you're not doing it, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, I think it's it's it drives. Uh, I don't know. If you, I can't remember his name, but there's a guy with long hair. He's massive. He's like twenty year old, massive, and you know, oh, Sam Sulak. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it just everybody wants to be like him, and easiest way to do it in that age, there's no fucking way he's natural. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. not at all. <laughs> I put my head on the stump to be chopped off for it. For it. <laughs> just like you know, um, but, you know, going going to coping coping mechanisms, it might not be seem that I have issues like that, but I reach now I'm on a fourth day again to not having sugar because if I'm oh, stressed, yeah. for example, my kids piss me off. I go and eat a, a whole jar of Nutella, right? <laughs> and then I feel really bad. I don't have a, a weight problem because my naturally my dad was skinny and my, I think my, my metabolism is like that. But sugar high, you know, I've got inflammation. I feel feel tired after it. But that's kind of, you know, instead of go and shout on them or hit them, I go and fucking Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's a bet, better way for them. So... But, yeah, that's it. Yeah, but you know, we all have got some kind of coping mechanism for something, and it's and it's easy to say, "Oh, just control it," right? I'm trying to quit sugar and chocolate. I think it's seven years now, and I go like nine nine weeks, and then something happens, and I fuck it. I just nah. <laughs> <laughs> but this time it will is. be different. <laughs> it is. It's, it's so it's so hard. Like people say, just eat less and move more. Well, yes, that works, yeah. but there's a reason why somebody's not moving more. Or eating less um, what are those reasons like that is true but some people are depressed so they don't even want to get out of bed some people only have been brought up that food means love that food is a coping skill um, you know so so it's unpacking all these limiting beliefs to be, before somebody can make the change and actually start losing the weight yeah and I see as well, you, you said that you see personal trainers. When I become personal trainers 15 or 20 years ago, um, I've seen the same people commenting, but I see that more and more in karate. Oh, look at that fat, fat, fat guy, you know, oh, this fat sensei walking around. But you know, don't know his story. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you don't have to be perfect in what you're doing in, when you're coaching. It's like, best example is football. How many footballers are football coaches? You need mm-hmm. to have a skills to coach people and explain. Yeah. You don't need to be able to do splits and, you know, lift 200 kilos to coach somebody. If you've got the skills, yeah. you know, even in boxing, you've got to cause the motto, produce Mike Tyson. And he was yeah. great. So it is kind of sad to see how people jumping and try to put down people instead of elevate everybody. Mm. 100%. I've, I've seen them videos online of people paying out, you know, overweight karate guys mm-hmm. and stuff and then there's a there's the odd couple that just start doing spin kicks and like you know moving like they're capoeira kings and that mm. you're like you know that dude knows his stuff you know yeah people judge people people judge and it's always you know 
you'll never meet a hater doing better than yourself. You know, all these people paying out on somebody trying to do something better for themselves mm. aren't doing good themselves. No, you know, hurt people, hurt people. And, and that's, and that's a true thing. You know, they're trying to pull other people down to make themselves feel better because they haven't gone out and achieved something, you mm. know? Yeah. They're sitting in the basement on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Just see Mike Tyson put on a heap of weight. Um, yeah, like yeah. When, when he first, when he gave up exercise completely and uh, people were paying on him. I'm like, how can you pay out Mike Tyson after what he's exactly. done? Yeah. yeah. Uh, people have got that expectation that, you know, you're always going to be that legend that you've been in twenties, yeah. but that's not reality. Um, yeah, not at you're all. Gonna, you, you're going to change. You're going to be different versions of yourself and you just have to do the best you can do at the time. Yeah. Isn't it? A hundred percent. It's it's funny now now that I can actually get back in the gym and and train a little bit now, seeing the younger guys. I thought I still sort of felt relatively young until um I started seeing the the purple belts in the gym, you know, in jiu-jitsu that are like twenty eight and competing. Until I saw them guys rolling and stuff, I thought I was young. <laughs> now now that I've seen them. I'm like, yeah, my expectations of myself have lowered a bit. Hundred <laughs> percent, you know, I'm going to BJJ as well, and the twenty year olds, thirty year olds coming in, just smashing through you. Especially that I'm small, so everyone's bigger than me. But seeing just as well how quickly they learn, you know, I've got a few guys who are starting the same time as me, but they are twenty years old, and their retention of information is so fast. It's just like, yeah. hang on, three weeks ago I had been equal with you. And now you're fucking beating me <laughs> crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I thought I was doing well. <laughs> but, yeah. I, I was rolling with um with one of the black belts and um he's he was like just had amazing top pressure. And I'll and I was starting to struggle to breathe and stuff like that. And anyway, he got up from showing me the move and mm. and he's like, see you do this, and he's like, and you're a big strong guy, you know. I'm sure you're rough and tough, and you know, you'll just power through it. In my head, I'm thinking I was about to tap just from you showing me the move. <laughs> and um, and I ended up saying that to him. I was like, man, as soon as I'm uncomfortable these days, I tap out. I don't tough yeah, through yeah. anything. And he goes, well, you know what? He goes, it takes 10,000 taps to get your black belt. He goes, get them out the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, do I'm doing the same. Tap quickly, tap early, be healthy. Yep. It's just not, not worth me. I used to always, you know, power through try to prove their point because I'm smaller, so I need to be stronger than everybody else. And I just, no, nah, tap, 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 tap. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I have no, I have no ego. I'm here to have fun and learn something maybe on, along the way, but I'm not, not anything to prove. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about, about your, um your mental health, like your version of like Tai Chi, I guess it is. Mm. That this, is that just slowed down Carters with breathing and stuff? Is that is that's something when I come back, I would like to learn off you and bring bring back here. Mm. That is that's awesome. Yeah, so so it started. So I used to be a walking leader for uh, walking for health, um, and there was few elderly there doing tai chi, and they said the prices went triple up. So we, they said, oh, "Can you do something?" Like I said, "Well, we can try." So I took all the kata that they like and I slowed down. I tried to change some movements to be more like mimicking tai chi. But then I thought, nah, that's not authentic and it's not me. So we got back to the just the regular uh, kata. But we're slowing them down and uh, I kind of softened the movement. So it's not so much uh, karate-like. It's more balanced, like, like Tai Chi, so, you know, from the heel and stuff. Um, but the main difference is our approach. So we're doing like warm-ups or stretches, uh, the mobilization of the joints. Then we go through the forms so people can pick them up obviously most of my clients are 60 to 100 years old so <laughs> 10 years down the line we're still on the two katas <laughs> but you know, until they have a fun till they have a fun it, it's great stuff and then we're doing a uh, 15 minutes of meditation so we choose the kata usually it's tensho and everybody does it in their own speed the natural breathing and being in a happy place whatever that means right and, yeah. and either they can try to not think about stuff or just let the thoughts come in, come out. Uh, but yeah. the main thing is to not criticize criticize them. And, yeah. not, you know, they said they've been in Tai Chi and the lady was saying, 
no, oh, you don't know your your form yet. You know, you need to pick up your pace and this. And I'm thinking, you're 70 years old. You had all the shit in your life. It's time to relax. You don't need that yeah. shit. So I don't yeah, that's pay that. And you know, until you're moving, it's fine. And to be honest, I didn't realize how much impact that's gonna be having because a the people who came with like post surgery or like oh, doctor said I'm never gonna be able to move my arm in a full range. Now they're doing full range. I've got 80 year olds doing full squat from just doing once a week exercising. Yeah. Um, they came as individuals. Now they are a group because the most important uh, for them is tea and coffee after, <laughs> not the exercise. <laughs> Get that away and uh, let's go for tea. <laughs> but you know, we've got a half an hour of chat and, and making a kind of preventing the loneliness and depression uh, because in UK is that in summer, every most of the classes shut down mm -hmm. and people going with the families and they le leave their parents behind. So there's nothing to do. So of counterintuitive in summer, I've got the most clients because they're coming into search for that community, being with somebody, yeah. having a chat, having that coffee. And I see that, you know, they came as individuals and now there are a group of people who go and do winter markets, traveling in the coach trips. So it's amazing to see that, you know, I'm, I'm quite often now with the coffee, I just sit in the corner, I step back completely. So I'm just the observer and they all having, you know, really good charts and gardening clubs and stuff like that. So they created the community and I think that's the biggest uh, result of that is. But in mm -hmm. terms of kata, we just slow down the kata and trying to, I picked up different kata. So in, in, in emphasizing like for tensho, mobilization of the joints, stability of the spine. We done that nine hanshi, so we're stepping on one leg, keeping that longer for a balance, so they can mm -hmm. work on the balance a little bit. And uh, then we're doing um, like uh, basai dai for spinning, so the, the orientation within the space and turning around and and stuff like that. And they enjoying it, you know. Mm -hmm. My uh, longest core group of six people is with me now, ten years, I think. Oh wow, that's phenomenal. And, you know, they, they keep coming. They can't get rid of them. I said to them, every training, <laughs> I try to get rid of you, but you keep coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read one of the books that you gave me, and it was really good, like a, when mm. everybody was telling their stories of why oh, they yeah. were doing the martial arts. Now, with you, that was really cool. The format I, the format was so interesting. I've never read a book like that before. Yeah, it was, it was really a cool. lot of anxiety for me because, you know, when you when you try to be a alpha, you try to make things perfect. And this book was on purpose, not perfect. So I didn't know how people are going to take and what's going to be response. It's going to be like, well, you couldn't be bothered to correct the grammar. But as you know, working with people with mental health, they're not always clear in, in their communications. It's lots of scrambled words, lots of repetition, losing the track. And, and I thought to be authentic and kind of have integrity and, and, give that people a voice it needs to be how they said it yeah um so so far i've got a really good reviews from it and people actually really really like it so i'm happy that i put my foot down because my wife is like a ocd grandma person <laughs> he's like no this is wrong just leave it please leave it leave it trust me leave yeah. it as this so um yeah so i'm it's looking actually forward... given me a bit of inspiration for my next one. Oh, cool Glad yeah. to hear. It's it's always nice to to help people, even if you don't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so wh when your book's coming out, when it's going to be available on uh, Amazon's and all the stuff? Are you going for well, Amazon? I, or... I'm not. I'm not happy with it yet. It's um, I would actually like to. So it's 325 pages. Um, it's a lot of diagrams and stuff, but I would actually like to um streamline it a lot more. I would like to basically summarize what I've written and make it just a lot more digestible. It's written how I talk, but it's a lot. So mm. um, I feel that I could condense it a little bit more. So I'll probably rewrite it another 10 times before I ever do release it. It's, it, it's the, all the, the knowledge I picked up over three years, uh, over you know the last 10 years. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the process. You just look at it and then how can I make it better? I'm not happy with this. It's it's very tiring. Yeah. But it's it's always worth it, right? Um yeah. 
you know, I don't have a talent for writing, so I keep saying to people it's not a Pulitzer, but it's you get what you see, right? If I go, um, I don't know. I thought it was pretty professional myself. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. You was, you, I was talking yesterday with one of the guys from Kyokushin, and he said to me, "Oh no, you look super confident, but you know, inside, I'm like, what I'm doing here, why I'm here, how how can I talk to people and and try to to be not stressed about it? But apparently, I, I come across that I do things correctly. But that's again coming back to my own anxiety and fear of judgment and um, kind of low self value. So you know, I do those stuff, mm. and the feedback like yours helped to build me up block by block up so i can be more confident person um when i when i was a kid i used to not stutter but i used to stumble my words a little bit i was very self-conscious very shy um i never thought i was any like any sort of leader i actually thought i was pretty stupid to be honest and um it's only since i started doing my tiktok and stuff like that that i'm getting comments saying i love the way you explained that and i'm like mm. me you like the way I explained it. <laughs> and it's it hasn't been until the last couple of years I've realized that I've got my own style. Mm. And the problem is you you watch somebody else talk online and you're like, like you might, because you do podcasts, you might watch Joe Rogan and go, geez, mm. I wish I had his vocabulary. I wish I could talk like that. But you don't need to. You need your own style. They, if everybody was a Joe Rogan, it'd all be boring, mm. you know? Funny enough, I was the other day watching your video and I thought, fuck, I wish I could talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wished I could talk like somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but it is that kind of self, well, we are the worst critics for our own. Every time I look on my videos, I think, fuck, why do I do this? Why do I look like this? I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with that. But the perception of self is so different than perception of other people of you. Mm, it, it is. I, I was nervous doing this. Like, mm, and, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> this is fairly, you know, it's fairly easy. Um, now that I'm here, it's cool. But like the five, and I know when, when we're traveling around doing all those martial arts, the day leading up to it, I'd say to my missus every day, why am I putting myself through this anxiety? Mm. Like, because I've got an expectation of the non crippled me doing martial arts in my 20s in Thailand going to these places and training with all these guns, like all these absolute top of their game trainers. And I've got a, a vision in my head of how I used to be mm. realizing that the doctor would had said, I'd never train again. I'd never walk properly again. I'd never lift over two kilos again. And then I had to keep reminding myself that you, you're never going to move like you used to, mm. but you've got to be bloody happy with the fact that you can train now. Like it's taken a lot of work to get to here. And these guys, you know, always sort of self-deprecated at the start. Like just letting you know, I was injured. I was fairly injured. I'm just getting back into it. You know what I mean? And um, by the end of it, I started getting, getting my jam back, you know, but Ooh. that, but that expectation that I went in with was what killed me. That gave me the anxiety because I wanted to, these in my head, I'm thinking these guys are thinking I'm a beast. I'm traveling around the world doing all these martial arts. They're got to be thinking, wow, this guy must be awesome. And then, so then I'm thinking they're going to get me on the pads and go, wow, he's slow. He's not flexible. He's what's this guy doing? You know? And it w wasn't until I got in there, started warming up and started feeling the groove and that again, that all that went away, but it usually went away within five minutes. Mm. It was just pushing through that day of absolute nervousness. Actually, yeah, I'm very nervous today because tomorrow we're flying to, I'm teaching in Sweden. And every time ah. I go teach to the new group, it's like, why do they want me to teach? What can I offer? <laughs> you know, why would they invite me to show my stuff? I don't know anything. Um, but like you said, when you're in there, it's it dynamics changes you and now you're doing stuff. It's it's nice and, and always, always nice people. I never had a seminar with the like, kind of horrible people. So yeah. kind of building myself up to it tomorrow morning flight. It's going to be good. I know the person who's invited me is going to be good. It's going to be good. Just don't, don't put yourself down. <laughs> and you know, it, it, it will be, it will be mm. awesome. It's like when I, when I looked up Tommy, who you introduced me to, mm. I was like, um, I looked up his stuff. I was nervous. I was so nervous after watching him train. 
Mm-hmm. And then when we well, while we were training, I've never felt like such a beginner in my life. <laughs> he yeah, is he's... so good. Um, I just, and I could have felt bad about that. I could have been like real self-conscious and stuff, but instead I was like, soak up this knowledge while I'm here. Like, mm. like take everything I can from, from this man who's just absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, he's one of the best coaches I know. Uh, I met him by on one of the seminars, and I thought, well, a boxer, big guy, kind of looking grumpy. He's going to be criticizing <laughs> everybody, everybody. But he's such a genuine, nice guy. And funny story with him. Uh, we we done uh, kind of on my last year's, like last year or two years ago, Karate for Mental Health. He came and joined us. He was teaching. And then we done an exhibition fight. So we mm. done boxing with him, right? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to be boxing. That whack hit me like seeing stars. <laughs> okay, we're going. And then he comes and said to me, oh, I knew you wouldn't appreciate if I go low light for you, you know, so I give you a good, good, good one. Thank you. You're, you're three times heavier than I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> but then when I even just, you. <laughs> even just training, he was like that, like because like we're doing Bartitsu and I'd mm-hmm. never done that before. And he was showing me some bare knuckle stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're doing this stuff like to the chin and um, like I was just mock doing it, you know, I wasn't really mm-hmm. doing it. And he's like, I'm not made of glass. Just, just <laughs> do it. <laughs> but yeah, he's an absolute gentleman. And yeah, I'd never felt like such a beginner before. Um, oh, that's cool. I'm happy that yeah. I was able to help because um, I know how it is, you know, maybe not for just traveling and training with people, but I know how difficult it is to find a good class when when i moved to uk i spent a lot of time to find uh gym to train the karate sessions to train and ev- eventually i end up doing my own yeah. <laughs> because there was nothing i could find and then you know through the connections for other people you find other people who introduce you to stuff so now we're doing actually um parts of tommy's uh, knife mitigation because it's the oh, best material yeah. i found so we incorporated it in our training and because here in 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 UK is a plague of stabbings now, especially I for young believe people. It. For young people, so I decided, fuck it, I'm gonna have to learn it because my son is seven now. Soon he's gonna be thirteen, and he needs to know what to do. So, but he started jujitsu last week. So, yeah, <laughs> I started so, a oh I I did a um Krav Maga instructor's course with Itai uh-huh. Gil, and we did a lot of knife defense. And I've never once taught it. I've mm. um I always said that. If I teach it to somebody and they get this fake air of confidence and somebody attacks them with a knife and they're like, mm. I know Krav Maga, I can defend this, and they get stabbed, you know, I don't want to give people that sense of security. Yeah. So I just never taught it. And I thought it was never that big of a problem in Australia. And then um, when when I went to England, you, you walk on the train and there's posters. Watch out for the knife fighting. Yeah. It comes over the radio. Uh, you know, beware of you know, knife violence. And, and I was just like, wow, you need to do knife training over here. Mm. And probably realistically probably do start to need it over here now as well. Mm. Yeah. It's every, every day it's it, it last five, six years. It's just going nuts. It Tommy was doing, we, we had a couple of months ago, the, the session in, in last year, it went 50% up and that's only yeah, the wow. recorded one. That's only yeah. the people who've been caught and, and reported to the police. So probably 90% up in stabbings and you know it, that, that's what happens when you've got the defunding police and you know you don't have a uh, people to search for for it and people um don't have a um harsh punishment for it so and they've got a culture they always love nice nice i don't know yeah. why in uk but you know that's the reality yeah. and i want to prepare my son it's not the kind of hands-on but awareness you know look look if they've got the fingers you can see the fingers and stuff like that try to just prepare him so stay away. First first line of defense, you're doing so much sports, you don't have a time to go anywhere. <laughs> so you not be there is the best defense. Yeah. But you know, he's gonna be in the age that we're gonna go with his mates to the pubs and stuff. So just just so he knows the awareness of it and and talk himself out, you know, and, and get get away and don't be stopped. And some physical stuff as well if you have to, but you know. Yeah. It never ends up well for people who defend themselves with a knife. We've done it in dojo and 100% deaths always. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since it's been funny too. Since um since we left the UK, I've thought about you a lot because 
you, you pop up all the time, you know, and the karate for mental health. And I'm thinking, I'm doing Muay Thai for mental health and and that. And I was like, why didn't you call it martial arts for mental health? Then I could have called it martial arts for mental health and we could have done like a, <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about this as well. I think somebody took that name already. There's martial oh, arts really? for mental health yeah. in UK. But um but yeah, I don't see the you know I don't see the problem between cooperation and uh, I, f I love karate so that was kind of and there was now but nothing happening here in that space so mm. I thought that was the logical stuff but to be honest um, I'm kind of toying with the uh, dropping that name um, mm. there's lots of people doing it we've got lots of people kind of joining as a movement but I see that people start kidnapping it uh, if, yeah. if that makes sense. So um, I, I was the first one where I live. The I was the first gym to do mental health. Um, as soon as I did and it became successful, every yeah. single gym where I live now in Geelong copied my exact idea. There was a couple of guys that we were actually going to hire and train up. Um, as soon as as soon as I spoke to the person, the in between person, and they they said, "Oh, how did you do it all?" and all that. And I was like, oh, cool. They, they, they're really interested. They want to know. I told them exactly how I structure my classes, how I interweave the mindfulness and the gratefulness practices for, you know, rough and tumble guys that if you said that to, they'd go, I'm not doing that shit. But I've got a way that I mesh it in that everyone loves it at the end. And I told them exactly how I ran the classes and they went and opened up like two weeks later, their yeah. own facility and stuff. And and that's happening flat out. And you know, they they say was it imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Mm. Um, however, but it hurts. some people, but yeah, it hurts. <laughs> but especially when people I know don't have the right qualifications and stuff, and they're saying that they do the same things I do, and mm. and all and all of that, because it makes me think you're going to hurt people. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so part of that, I was thinking, especially because you guys are doing it over there too. We're doing it here. If we had like a governing body of mm. martial arts for mental health where um, like we had a counselor sort of training or even a life coaching, like, but a module that you had to complete for counseling, a module you had to complete, had to, had to implement it in through martial arts. And then we made it like a governing body so people could join that mm. they'd be able to get the, the training stuff. And then they'd be able to say they're actually accredited to do the mental health for martial arts. They're not just a, I can't stand all these personal training life coaches, you know, mm. who still live at home and do coke on the weekends. Um, <laughs> they, they, they've done a, a neuro-linguistic programming weekend mm. course and and they're trying to help people when really they're probably going to hurt people more than help. So, so I, I was thinking about it as well, but the, the problem with me is that I, I have no formal qualification, so I'm not using it as a therapy. I'm using yeah. it more as a uh support tool for the therapy right so people go yeah. for a thera therapy they've got the protocols but i'm using it as a exercise addition to it right so i don't try to help yeah, yeah, people yeah. i have no no knowledge about it i'm just providing a but your, your book says otherwise <laughs> your books and that say otherwise <laughs> well but, but you know i'm not uh, i'm not um giving advice to people if that makes sense right i'm not yeah, qualified yeah. to you know Oh, you've got this condition. You've got this condition. I'm just welcoming and you know helping people. How to how to say it? Right? It's not a it's not a therapy, uh, as yeah. in a, in a legal sense of it. But yeah, yeah, I was thinking to do for uh, for a karate uh, based on the modules I done for the awareness. Do like a awareness so they can more understand the mental health and what might come into the their dojo, right? Mm, but yeah, yeah. If, if 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 yeah, interesting concept. I, I would yeah. be up for it. Because I I do think it's neat because everybody's doing it now. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, and there's no mm. regulation for it at all. And there yeah. probably should be. And like to say, like no formal qualifications. That the the first course, well, one of the first courses I did, I did my first three with a guy on Udemy. It's a um, mm. he's from your neck of the woods, actually. Um, mm. He's called Kane Ramsey. He's on um, Udemy. His course costs about 15 bucks each one. Uh -huh. He does a life coach one. He does a counseling and he does a mindfulness. If you do all, I did all three and then uh -huh. I went and did my 
real, you know, government qualified um, counselling course. I nearly went to sleep every class. It was so boring. And all I did was watch his videos. They cost me 15 bucks for the course. And I learned more in his online course for 40 hours oh, than cool. I did in my government funded one. Cool. You know, yeah, it's un unbelievable, his, his courses. And if you, oh. if you find the right ones, you know, it doesn't need to be formal. But yeah. Yeah. But you just, you know, for a, for a purpose as well of insurance here in UK, I, I, yeah, I tried to stay away, and I, you know, it's leave it to professionals. My opinion, right? I, I <laughs> well, it's funny. I got training. I got audited, audited the first day I opened. I didn't oh, even have a client yet. Yeah, so mm. um, my ex partner, who was fairly abusive, um, uh, our dream was to open up what I opened up, and um, so. Somebody got a tip, the, the government got a tip saying I wasn't licensed to do what I was doing and all of this sort of stuff. And um, I sent all my information in. A week later, I got the letter saying, you're all good to go. You've passed all the tests and all that sort of stuff. But it does happen. Like mm -hmm. people trying to pull you down into that bucket, yeah. they, they will do it. So, yeah, you're doing the right thing. Like you got to you got to make sure you've got your boxes ticked because yeah. there's always someone out to get you. Funny enough, yesterday I had a message from somebody from Italy. Oh, send me all your materials. I want to, uh, how, where should I start with Karate for Mental Health? I said, well, I'm, I'm not actually understand what you want me to do, but my books are online. I said, oh, so you're not going to give me anything for free? I said, no, you know, I spent 30 years doing my craft and experiences and paying money for it. Um, so now you can buy the books. No, but, you know, I want your papers and stuff. I said, well, I think you misunderstand me because... It's not <laughs> therapy. Do you have got a psychological degree? No, because I don't need to. I don't do therapy. Oh, okay. Okay. Crystal clear and, and fucked off. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I was actually once the once the quick business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually done a video yesterday about it on 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 YouTube that you know it it is not therapy. It's a tool to help people, and you don't necessarily have to be having a mental health condition. It's just kind of well-being tool for keeping you in the right space you know yeah, hitting yeah, parts 100%. helps a lot right so. yeah 100 yeah. percent gets you out of your head it's grounding so in like traditional ter therapy you say it's like top down therapy talking therapy mm -hmm. but then when you're saying like uh bottom up therapy or so you know you're going through the body like doing somatic therapy that would be you know doing it through martial mm -hmm. arts and that. so it still is and you're doing it exactly how you should be doing it mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll see. I, I, like I said, when kids are gonna be a bit older, I'm gonna go into the. I was thinking actually what I want to do because I'm torn between a sports coaching and mm. a yeah. mental health stuff. So I see how I'm gonna feel them. Maybe I go to both. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Troy, but... if you could give us uh, all the where people can find you, promote yourself, and all the links and stuff. Yeah, so under Complete Health Geelong is probably the easiest one on uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Um, and I post different stuff to my own page, which is Troy Conchies on Facebook as well. And I've just done a uh, uh, YouTube as well, but I'm not updating that as much because I'm still getting savvy using all this technology. It's still <laughs> not my jam. <laughs> yeah, so um, usually uh, TikTok for bikey stuff and like similar to the stuff I was talking about before, you know, um, like dissecting some trauma sort of stuff. And, and then if you want to see what all my groups and, and all that are doing, yeah, down to um, complete out along. We're going to put all the And the, mo the motorbike there. stuff. Oh, but you've got a pretty big motorbike culture in the UK too, don't you? I'm not in bikes at all. My wife is, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> my fr my so, friend, friend Martin is in the biking clubs, and yeah, there's lots of yep. um, lots of bikers around. Yep. So that's um the mental health militia, that's mm -hmm. on uh, TikTok, and we're more active on Facebook though as well. Okay, cool. I'm gonna put all the links in the description below so you can have a look. But I highly recommend to look at the Troy stuff, uh, top stuff, better than mine. Uh, he speaks better <laughs> than me, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, so. I'm, and I'm looking forward to that book. Um, I'm sure you need to write more. 
more, 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 more of good things. Well, I'll be, I'll be, um, I'll be really interested in your feedback. You'll be the second person I've sent it to. Awesome, awesome. Happy to, <laughs> happy to read it. All right, yeah. thank you very much. No worries. Thanks for having me. Well done for listening to all of it. Um, you are a superhero. Thank you very much for your support. And if you could leave us that review on a podcast platform, that would be amazing. Uh, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your support. And I wish you all the best until the next one. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.